You have heard it all before, the fastest growth in the region, but the poor aren't sharing in it. It's not inclusive. The government knows and admits that and says it's updated its economic plans to make sure growth reaches farms, our brothers who haven't had as much formal education, our sisters in the poorest and most disaster and violence prone provinces. Over the next five weeks, we'll talk to some of the men and women in charge of speeding up and spreading that growth and some of the brothers and sisters who are waiting for it. I'm Coco Alquaz. This is ANC Presents Philippine Development in Focus. Ramil Anasho works as a construction worker at the pier, earning 2,500 pesos every week. Before working at the pier, Ramil has done work back home in Eastern Samar and factory work in Bulacan. Mayra po kasi ang trabaho doon sa ano sa sa kami sa sama. Hindi po, hindi po kasi ganun maano yung pagsasaka pagsasaka namin ng panay. Life hasn't been easy for the Anasho family. It's no wonder they find it hard to believe that the Philippines is the third fastest growing economy in the region. If life is hard for the Anasha family who lives in Metro Manila, the center of economic activity and one of the three regions that account for 62% of the economy, imagine how much harder it must be for those living in far-flung places, in conflict-torn areas, or those in so-called natural disaster hotspots. Inclusive growth has been the buzzword of the Aquino administration, but there's growing impatience that growth hasn't trickled down to the majority of Filipinos. The government says it takes more than a decade of sustained growth to lift the living standards of the majority of Filipinos. The question is, can we fast-track this process? That's what the Philippine Development Plan midterm update wants to tackle. Neda believes including sectoral and spatial strategies, apart from cross-cutting strategies, can quickly generate opportunities for more people and make progress more inclusive. Under sectoral strategies, government will work to increase productivity and innovative capacity in the services sector. It will also work to increase diversification in and strengthen linkages between agriculture and manufacturing sectors to generate more jobs. Under spatial strategies, regions are assessed based on their economic characteristics and geographic locations to determine the constraints they face and address them properly. While the cross-cutting strategies offer a whole menu of government interventions aimed at improving the quality of life, including improving the business climate, delivering better social services, and adapting to climate change. With just two more years to go, the Aquino administration races against time to seal its reform legacy and deliver on a promise of a better life. Hopefully, sooner than later. We begin tonight with the head of the National Economic Development Authority, which wrote and updated the Philippine Development Plan, Secretary Arsenio Balisacan. Secretary, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me, Coco. After all your years as an economist, has it surprised you that such strong growth hasn't been more inclusive? Uh, not quite. Uh, remember that uh, from 2003 to 2009 to 2009, we had data from 2003 to, to, and then 2006, 2009. During that period, uh, poverty uh, was all quite flat, uh, and uh, and there was. Uh, some uh, modest growth uh, during that period, but uh, uh, and uh, and uh, unemployment was also uh, uh, high. And in 2012, we saw a bit of a reduction. Uh, in 2013, that's when we had uh, we saw quite a relatively sharp reduction in the poverty incidence. So uh, I, I think that uh, uh, what uh, we, uh, we uh, or what the Philippine Development Plan um, aimed for, which, which is to uh, put the economy into a higher growth trajectory so that we could reduce poverty, uh, uh, was quite uh, proper. Uh, but of course, we could have done better, and uh, the updated plan is intended to address those concerns. What would you say is the biggest change um, in the update compared with the original plan? We 
try to, to dissect the lessons we have learned from uh, the past three years. Uh, and it, uh, w one thing that, uh, it, b that became so uh, pronounced is that, uh, uh, and it, this is also seen in other countries, no? that uh, uh, growth is necessary but not sufficient. Uh, we need to do uh, other things to sharpen the connection between economic growth and, and poverty reduction. And it turns out that uh, it matters a, gr a great deal where that growth is coming from. If that growth is coming from sectors that are not uh, creating enough jobs, then uh, uh, that uh, growth is not going to deliver uh, much poverty reduction. So the, what's different about this plan now is to uh, specifically uh, uh, focus on those uh, growth drivers that can deliver uh, poverty reduction that can employ um, the le um, a lot of, of, uh, of uh, our workers. Before we bring in the other panelists, it's a very thick uh, report that you um, uh, prepared. Um, could you name one item where you saw this could be a very effective growth driver? We need to get our, our, uh, our industry, our manufacturing, resurging again. Uh, because that's where a lot of good quality jobs would be coming from. We need to connect our uh, agriculture, our uh, particularly small uh, farming sector, to industry, to, to manufacturing, to high value uh, chain, so that the uh, uh, farmers would be uh, connected to, uh, to markets. You were, we were talking about this earlier, and you mentioned a specific instance. Could you, could you elaborate on that? A big part of the problem uh, of, uh, uh, of our small farmers, uh, by the way, uh, in agri uh, poverty is most pronounced in agriculture, and for every three persons, uh, poor persons that we have in this country, about two of them would be dependent on agriculture. And so improving uh, access to uh, employment, uh, quality employment, improving uh, opportunities for growth, income growth in agricultures, uh, is bound to, uh, to be key to, to poverty reduction. And here, um, what we really need to do is to connect uh, our small farmers to the high value chain uh, so that their productivity will rise, their in incomes will rise. And a good example here is what uh, uh, Jollibee, for example, is doing in, uh, in many parts of the country now. It, it started initially in, uh, in uh, Nueva Ecija, where uh, Jollibee comes in, uh, uh, assure the farmer, farmers of uh, the market for their produce, talk with the government that if the government would help them, uh, they would uh, uh, be willing to do their part of uh, connecting the, the farmers to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to their market. And, uh, and because these farmers are assured of, uh, of, of market, uh, uh, banks also were re were willing and ready to provide them credit. And here, uh, Jollibee did not even provide any subsidy at all. It's just the, the getting the farmers connected to to the market and getting government to 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 work with them to uh, to uh, assist them in uh, assist these farmers in. Uh, uh, in the local areas. We're going to talk more about how the government can encourage that kind of activity. We're going to take a very short break, more of this program when we come back. Stay with us. To make growth inclusive, the government has to identify where poverty takes hold. The Philippine Development Plan talks about provinces with large numbers of poor Filipinos, though some of those provinces are rich, and provinces that have a high percentage of poor. In the eastern part of the country, because it's hit by so many typhoons in areas, and in areas of Mindanao and elsewhere that are handicapped by long-running peace and order problems. In the agri-sector, 
because of the lack of linkages to the faster growing service and industry sectors. Joining Secretary Balisakan is Ed Bulyaser, a top executive in agro-industrial businesses based in Mindanao, who now helps other companies do the same. And in our audience are representatives from the Eye Care from Bangsamoro Movement and representing service industries, the Tourism Congress of the Philippines. Also with us are members of the Junior Philippine Economic Society. Welcome to all of you. Let's begin with you, Ed. Um, how difficult is it to be in the agriculture business in the Philippines, and particularly in the agriculture business in Mindanao and, for example, parts of Bangsamoro? Agriculture, per se, as we know, is um, uh, faced with inherent uh, challenges. Uh, that's basically the weather, the growing season. Um, you're supposed to plant, but the rain's not yet there. You're supposed to irrigate, and assuming you have money to do the irrigation, to spend for it, but the water's not there. So there's these sorts of things. No? So that's on the inherent, as we say. But what's also becoming inherent nowadays is the competition from so-called and it's also true, a more effective agricultural producers. Our neighbors in, in Asia, a lot of these agricultural crops that can be produced well by Filipinos um, are actually being, it's cheaper to import them and come, uh, what's that called, the Asian integration. And we're already scared because we'll be flooded with uh, uh, agricultural products that we cannot compete with because they, they can land in the Philippines cheaper than we produce them. What are some of the reasons why we can't compete, why it's difficult for us to compete? I hate to say this because uh, it might be insensitive. Labor cost is high. For example, I spoke to one uh, Indonesian businessman and he said their minimum wage is 150 pesos. And I said, so how come our agricultural work, and we're talking agriculture, we're not talking about technical jobs. So I said, how come um, we cannot survive so-called with uh, 150 or even 200 pesos? Turns out, for example, the rice is like 25 pesos per kilo. How much is rice here? So just one factor, I mean, on, on the labor, which is a big component of agricultural. Co well, the other one would be the inputs. Uh, we wish all the best for Secretarial Kalas uh, organic pr uh, production. Uh, program, but for as long as we import a lot of the chemical fertilizers and the pesticides, uh, and our, our farming technology is chemical dependent to a large extent, then those, that's, that's a, the other factor that makes us less competitive. Secretary, how do we begin to solve those kinds of problems, those kinds of challenges? We need to raise productivity. That's the, the, that's the uh, crucial thing there that uh, output per unit of uh, per hectare of land must uh, have to uh, increase to the levels of uh, of our neighbors, particularly uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, to be competitive. China is uh, productivity is very high. Now, uh, to get uh, to to increase that level of productivity, to achieve the high level of productivity, we need to invest uh, in. Uh, in, the, in our most binding constraints are rural, rural development. And the, this most binding constraint is infrastructure, young poor quality of the infrastructure, such that moving goods, whether these are inputs, imported inputs, or locally produced inputs from, from uh, Luzon to, to, uh, to us, uh, uh, would, uh, would be uh, uh, less expensive than uh, what they are now. Uh, uh, we need to uh, to connect our f small f uh, farmers no uh, to uh, to the marketplace to the particularly the high value chain um, because if you don't uh, even if you increase productivity uh, uh, out uh, the prices there will 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 fall if unless you can bring them out uh, and again uh, very crucial here is infrastructure and um, we do know that this is the, uh, a major concern, uh, and we have uh, been raising our level of spending from 2.5% uh, in 2012 of, of, uh, of GDP no? to, to uh, 5% by 2016. Uh, and a, a big part of that in infrastructure development would be on, uh, on uh, roads, ports, uh, seaports. And, and have, so. you been, have you seen this happening in Mindanao? Oh, yes, it is. During the last several years, of course, uh, this price is called inconvenience, but 
roads are improving. Uh, well, they already where there were no roads, the roads are bad. Now they are concrete. So yes, uh, there's we we do we do feel we do see ex and experience and benefit from uh, this improvement of the infra infrastructure. As a farmer, as a as an agricultural producer, I do see uh, improvement. I do see better life in the future, towards the future. But where we are now, uh, let's just say, still a struggling, uh, as we have been anyway. What would be the most helpful thing the government can give to the agriculture sector? Really appreciating that the government is earnestly trying its best. I would say three fingers. I point to the government, three fingers point back at me. The farmer, the worker, the agricultural uh, producer. Um, what else? I don't know. Well, we, we have absolute faith in the, in the bureaucracy. There's inherent slowness in the bureaucracy, but there's also strength in there. And plants like the PDP, never perfect, but for as long as it is open to suggestions, then... Let's uh, talk about Mindanao and, and Bangsamoro. Um, the, the peace agreements are on their way. Uh, has there been a dividend already from that? Have you seen the dividend yet? In terms of um, hope, Yes, uh, that's already a dividend. In terms of the positive attitude on both sides, the MILF and the government, this being supported at the highest levels, yes, uh, that's also a, a dividend there. High expectations, and it's good to be optimistic. There's also, although the danger is if it is failed, you know, sometimes we expect too much but we were not able to do enough. Have you seen investments begin to grow? Investors positioning to come in, yes, but as we know... So, in pa pumipirma? <laughs> no, not yet. In our case, uh, for example, we had announced that we were expanding 4,000 hectares in Maguindanao. Only, and, and we included in our program that the workers would really be the Mujahideens, the, the rebels. We will design a special program for them. And even uh, Chairman Murad was very happy with that plan. And he said, that's unusual, but most welcome. But until now, we still haven't started. But in terms of preparations, like scouting for lands, different companies are already doing that within the Bangsamoro. In our audience is Jamal Latifa. Jamal Latif, rather. He is uh, a member of the I Care for Bangsamoro movement. Have you felt the, the so-called peace dividend? Uh, firstly, I'll say uh, Ramadan Karim to all. Uh, regarding the questions, I f think it's pretty much to say that, but there's so much confidence among the people in Mindanao, and there's a euphoric. However, after the signing, and until now, there's still, what do you call this, uh, pending or delay of the Bangsamoro basic law to be implemented. And they're still talking about it until now between the government and the MILF. So we have to see it before we can say that there is a peace in Mindanao. But really, at the end of the day, we have to talk about the development growth in Mindanao. If you can resolve the uh, poor infrastructures, the poor educations, the poor local governance, the 45 years old revillions in Mindanao, all of those factors that really hampered the development and really caused the inequality in Mindanao, if those things can be resolved, and yes, there will be a development. But as to the Bangsamoro Basic Law, that has to be, remain to be seen. Which of those would you want Secretary Balisakan to prioritize the next time they talk about Bangsamoro in the cabinet? I think they have to prioritize the basic infrastructures in Mindanao. There's a DAF given to the autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao, about 8.5 billion. And I saw yesterday on their website, it says that on agriculture, they're given about 7.5% and more on, I think, on education. But that education will trickle down after a decade or two, two years, but that's good. We can say I agree to uh, Mr. Uh, from, from the Maguindanao, who's embedded so much about the agriculture, we can say yes, there is a development after few, probably after the President Aquino. But they have to focus on the basic infrastructures and, of course, resolving the conflict in Mindanao. If basic law, the Bangsamoro basic law, will succeed, and yes, we can talk about growth, we can talk about peace and development, and then, of course, the, uh, finally resolve the, the Mindanao rebellion. Secretary, there are a couple of pages in this uh, very long report that talks about the Bangsamoro Agreement. It's the only part of the, of the report that doesn't have numbers. It's about peace agreements, etc. cetera. Um, to that question, uh, how, how is the government pushing that so that it gets uh, completed sooner or, qu or more quickly? 
it's very high in our agenda. We do realize that uh, that uh, the potentials of Mindanao are huge, uh, and uh, and uh, getting this peace process uh, move forward um, uh, is key to really inclusive growth, not only for Mindanao but for the rest of the country. Uh, as I keep uh, also saying, the the, uh, the potentials of Mindanao for agriculture, for manufacturing, for tourism, enormous. And uh, if we can get Mindanao moving quick uh, enough, fast enough, we have an additional growth driver uh, that uh, can get this country moving to a higher uh, growth trajectory. Uh, let me just note uh, that um, we need to get this uh, development plan uh, for min for the Bangsamoro uh, that will accompany the 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 the, the, the legal uh, the charter uh, uh, because uh, we also we need to make sure that those resources that are going there are properly coordinated targeted so that we can get uh, the best uh, outcomes. I know there's a question in the audience from Brian Ayan about food, Brian. What strategies can be employed or have been employed by the administration for inclusive growth towards the agricultural sector, given that there is currently a shortage of garlic, a good with no clear substitutes, and a dependence on imported rice, which is a staple food in our country? I know you don't deal in, in, in garlic or rice, I think. Um, but when you just talk about agriculture in general and the government's policy there, what do you think, how would you... How would you describe or characterize government's policies when it comes to agriculture? I would say government would like to do its job, but we do not feel it is effective enough. Um, maybe unfair to demand so much from government. I guess that's what I would really say as a, as a private sector. Uh, earlier in our discussion, um, I did mention about our desire for more responsive agricultural financing, for example. How can we compete with our um, with agricultural producers from other countries when their cost of money is, let's say, one or two percent or three percent interest per annum, and Filipino farmers have to contend with? If it is not a prime rate that's given by the bank, it's like twelve plus two percent for the regular land bank financing. Uh, now banks are awash with money and we're being offered with seven or eight percent. But that's still a far cry from, um, um, you know, what the competition has uh, in their countries. What is the government planning to do to raise, to lower rather, the cost uh, of money for agriculture? Part of the reason why um, uh, cost of money is high in, uh, in agriculture is the very high, you mentioned about the risk, it's the inherent risk of agriculture, number two. It's the the, the uh, very poor infrastructure uh, um, in agriculture uh, in rural areas in general, because those um, difficulty of uh, of movement, uh, whether goods or people or animals, uh, uh, raise the, the 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 cost of operations and the cost of doing business. So that's why uh, uh, norm in in many developing countries, normally the cost of credit is much higher in rural areas in ag in agriculture than in urban areas. That does not mean that we can't do anything about it. We can, as, as I said, uh, 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 there are other ways. We don't have to defend the government uh, because many of the past government uh, credit programs, uh, to begin with, uh, uh, were failures uh, and. Billions of money were in the past were poured into credit programs, but if you look at the impact of those, um, they, they, uh, they did not raise productivity. They, they, the benefits of those, um, the beneficiaries of those programs were not the poor, were not the small farmers. They're, they're the big farmers. They're, they're not, not poor at all. So we need to think of, of better ways of providing, uh, delivering assistance to farmers, and I think that. Getting the small farmers linked with the market, 
link with the uh, manufacturers, with the processors, uh, with the input suppliers uh, is uh, part of that s s a solution. I think the, the example of, the, of Nestle, the example of uh, Jollibee and, and many others that are already being pioneered, not only in this country but in other countries can work well. Uh, the other one is, I think that in the case of, of, of Mindanao, I, I do think that there is a, a good case for government actually um, uh, providing um, assistance in the form of, of, of finances to investments in, in Mindanao. You can call this as, uh, uh, as part of the investment in peace building, in, uh, but I think that uh, uh, without uh, uh, economic activities, uh, um, um, generated there and come in quickly as we are forging this uh, uh, this peace uh, process. Uh, uh, we are not going to go anywhere, and we do. Uh, and and the plan does reflect that that we need to get this coordination uh, properly uh, undertaken. Thank you very much. Before we take a break, here are some comments we're receiving from Facebook and Twitter. From Facebook, Aldrin suggests taking a cue from the economic strategy of our neighbors, specifically Singapore or Taiwan. From Twitter, Timmy D believes that government should make should make opening new businesses easier for entrepreneurs, getting rid of red tape and granting tax holidays to new businesses. This is a question we're going to be asking Bill in the next part of the show. Also on Twitter, Cantilan Kid says, it's time to create policies or incentives to encourage companies to take care of their employees and to increase salaries. You can join our discussion online. Please use the hashtag PHDevelopment or send us a line on Twitter and Facebook. You can also watch us on www.abscbnnews.com slash live. We'll take a quick break. Up next, competitiveness and innovation. This is ANC Presents, Philippine Development in Focus. the CN 2015 arriving on or about the end of 2015, making our businesses, industries, and economy competitive should be a national priority. Two measures of that are the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Report, which ranks countries based on how easy it is to navigate their regulations, and the World Economic Forum's Global Competitiveness Report, which ranks economies in a dozen areas, from regulations to the state of infrastructure, to the quality of the workforce, and other factors. With us now is Bill Luz of the National Competitiveness Council, where he tracks our performance in those surveys and tries to get local governments and national agencies to make the changes needed to raise our scores. Bill, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. We've talked about this a lot. If you were to point to one or two areas that you've been working on, that the, the government has been working on to speed up and cut red tape, what would stand out for you? Well, if we take a look at the overall uh, ease of doing business report of IFC uh, and World Bank, we jumped by, we overtook 30 countries last year. Uh, we were the top performing in terms of year on year change uh, globally. Uh, we've never, never done that. And, uh, you know, we had been stuck in a very low position for many years. So I think uh, there's no single measure because you have to, one measure won't do the job. You have to improve across a, a broad front. So there are uh, 10 processes uh, that businesses have to go through with government in that particular study, and we improved on seven of the 10. And it's that level of uh, sort of uh, uh, variety of, of, of improvements and uh, consistency, I think, that will bring us up. So if you take a look at all, we track 12 reports, and out of the 12 reports, we are up on, I believe, nine uh, of those reports now over the last three years. So that, that speaks to consistency. That's something we haven't had in the past. Is there a specific project that you're proudest of? Uh, I, I can't say I have a specific project. I have several that I'm extremely uh, proud of, and I'm proud of, of the staff for being able to pull it together. Uh, one of them is the ease of doing business uh, task force. Uh, the president... Uh, 
uh, agreed to set up such a task force uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, that has resulted in the jumps. And uh, I'm proud of it because it brought together public and private sector uh, to work together, and it brought uh, you know national government agencies and local governments to work together. And you know it, it's always easy to say let's have one agency fix a problem. Now go to NETA, they'll fix it. But the fact, the truth remains, it it takes you know five, six seven agencies to fix any one problem because it's such a chain of events. So the fact that we can get so many people working together, uh, you know, is, is, a, is, a, is a great accomplishment. So is there a standout regulation or process that you're proudest about in terms of being able to shorten it, quicken it? Uh, I, I would say um, we've had a combination. Uh, one is resolving insolvency. Now, not, not many people look at this as a, as, as a big event. You know, this is how to how to go to, to, through the system to formally shut down your company, recover your investment, and reinvest it. Uh, it used to take a long time. Uh, since the law was passed, there were no implementing rules and regulations, and it took forever to get it done. Uh, Supreme Court finally uh, released the implementing rules and regulations, put it into effect, and uh, we made a massive improvement. We overtook 65 countries in that one indicator. Uh, there are other indicators where uh, paying taxes, you know, uh, to pay your withholding, your, your, your payroll taxes to the SSS, not just BIR, but you have to pay SSS, PhilHealth, Pagibig. Uh, that's all manual. And, and uh, believe it or not, a company will go through 50 transactions with government just to pay taxes per year. Uh, we've been able to, to drop that significantly and continue to, to, to drop that. And automation has been the key. I think SSS is the standout here. Uh, taking the uh, companies with 10 or more employees from uh, a monthly uh, analog process to, a, uh, to an online process. So those are just among the two. There are others uh, out there uh, that where we have had improvements. What process has been the most frustrating for you? The absolute most frustrating, I think, has been that of starting a business. Uh, starting a business, we rank 170th in the world out of 190 countries, so that's pretty low. And uh, we go through a very manualized process, and that's one of those processes that when you want to incorporate a company, you have to run through seven agencies. You go through Department of Trade, Securities Exchange Commission, BIR, SSS, PhilHealth, PagIBIG. Then you go through your local government, which means barangay clearance, mayor's permit, and all that. So it's a whole range of events. Uh, that's 15 steps in 35 days minimum. Uh, countries around the world can get that done in three days or less, the best. So our goal is to get down to, you know, between one and three days to, for that incorporation procedure in about two years' time. Uh, that's our most frustrating because just by standing still and doing nothing, your ranking drops. So we used to be 161st and we dropped to 170 doing nothing. So I asked my staff, find out who moved because that means someone moved. Turns out 50 countries in the world moved in, that say, in the year that we stood still. So the net effect is you get pushed down. So, you know, standing still can kill you. These, uh, these surveys and reports, one of their measures is uh, corruption. And I know we have a question in the audience from Mary Grace uh, Lagdamen about uh, corruption. Mary Grace? Hi, sir. Um, do the government, do the current major issue of our country today, which is um, corruption among people within the government, affect the overall per productivity and performance of our industries? Uh, well, it certainly does. And the more corruption there is, uh, the greater a negative environment you, you create. No? So what has happened, if you put it back into context, if I take a look at our performance for the last uh, three years, uh, we've actually improved our ranking on the uh, Transparency International's uh, Corruption Perceptions Index. We are plus 40 in the last three years. That means we've overtaken 40 countries. Okay? So it used to be, if you think it's bad now, it used to be much, much worse before. If I take a look at the World Economic Forum, on uh, 12 categories of uh, uh, where the country's ranked, uh, the category of governance, which is called institutions in that report, uh, is our highest, uh, it's our best performing uh, category over the last three years. So we've made some headway in the, uh, the uh, uh, anti-corruption fight, but it shows that we have a long way to go. So something we should never take for granted, something that we're, we should be uh, completely vigilant, but something where we should be thinking about uh, the timelines. When, when, was corrupt, you know, when was corruption at its peak 
and when, uh, how has it been improved over time? Uh, is it getting or better or is it getting worse? We constantly study this, not only through these surveys, but we, we uh, work with SWS for an annual enterprise survey on corruption, where only businessmen are asked about their experience, not their perception, but also their experience of corruption at local government level and uh, national government level. We've done this for three years, and uh, our findings show that uh, uh, there was improvement uh, last year, a little bit of deterioration. Uh, uh, the year, you know, or two years ago, there was big improvement, then a little bit of slippage uh, last year, depending on which LGU. So uh, it, it has to be constantly uh, worked on. It, it, it affects business, for sure. One of the sectors that everyone says the Philippines should be very competitive, is, competitive in is tourism. And uh, in our audience is Victor Martinez of the Tourism Congress of the Philippines. You know, in the tourism, uh, for the tourism stakeholders, the inbound tourist growth is directly proportional to inclusive growth. But the biggest factor that's preventing tourism growth is uh, air connectivity. So we'd like to find out from the Secretary if uh, when are we going to make a decision in whether to improve the present NAIA or to transfer somewhere else. Because I think this is the biggest hurdle, uh, hurdle to our uh, 10 million tourists in uh, 2016, it's just around the corner. We have uh, just completed the uh, transport roadmap for uh, Metro Manila and uh, neighboring areas, uh, which include uh, the uh, plan for uh, uh, connect air connectivity, na, the airport, particularly in Metro Manila. And what our uh, uh, consultant, uh, the JICA in this particular case, that helped us uh, uh, generate that plan, is, uh, is uh, uh, a development of international airport uh, uh, in Sangli. Um, of course, we do know that there are other private sector proposals, right? Uh, particularly the uh, San Miguel. Uh, and uh, we are now closely um, looking at that now, and that we have the, uh, the transport roadmap. But bec because what we really needed uh, then was a, an integrated uh, 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 transport uh, for the metropolis, for the mega met metropolis, to ensure that when we build uh, expressways or railways, they go somewhere. Yeah, right? And in this case, we want to make sure that it will be in the airport. Okay, then number, number one. Number two is, it turns out that in the study done by the Department of Tourism Secretary, uh, 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 Moni Jimenez, no? that uh, if we develop uh, our airports outside of Metro Manila, the Cebu, the Buracay, the Iloilo, the, the Bohol, the, and so on, you can get all these international airports uh, uh, opened up and developed fast. A lot of the inbound passengers can actually go directly to those areas. We're saying that 30 to 40 percent of the inbound passengers coming to Metro Manila could actually go directly to those areas. No? And so, uh, a, a big part of our uh, airport development is to the developing uh, this, uh, these other airports. Uh, we have just uh, approved, for example, the, the Lagidingan uh, expansion and operation management, the, the Bohol. Uh, in the next uh, two weeks, we'll be going to the board, uh, NEDA board, for the other, uh, four other airports, no? for, to, to, to elevate them, make them international standard. Secretary, you didn't answer his question. When is the decision coming? Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, hopefully <laughs> before the end of this. You know, uh, uh, I hope it can we can we can we can do that within the year. I hope, uh, but you know, it's uh, I, I can it's not me only. Uh, it's it's uh, the NEDA board as a whole uh, deciding does, that. Does that satisfy you? <laughs> well, uh, we've been waiting for a long time, so uh, <laughs> end of the year will be a uh, no. Well, uh, a good starting point for a decision. Let, let, me, may, let me point out, and I'll, I'll give you the private sector view on what I've seen as the decisions that have been made. No? Um, first point is we think we need a better international gateway, and we need more than just Metro Manila, NAIA. No? And uh, so it's a, sort of a dual airport strategy that, that we should have. Whether it's NAIA and Clark or NAIA and Sangli, we think that it has to be two, not shutting down one for the other. Uh, we think there's something to be said for having an in-city airport, as most major cities are having these days. So 
what decisions have been made? Well, Naia is being uh, uh, renovated right now, no? And that should be completed, uh, we're hoping, by uh, January or February of 2015. Uh, terminal 3 is about to be, that decision has been made on Terminal 3. And uh, as that gets completed by around uh, two more months from now, say August, uh, we should see the five largest airlines operating in Naia transfer to Terminal 3. That will decongest Naia 1 and then speed up the renovation in Naia 1. And then as Secretary Balisakan said, uh, there are regional airports which are uh, being upgraded and, and made of international uh, quality, if not international airports. No? Now, why is this important? Uh, we need to have these airports, first of all, uh, night rated, uh, because we can stretch their operating hours. That will decongest Manila. The reason we have de congestion in, in Naia is because they have to take off or land before the sun sets in, in the provinces, and so that piles all the takeoffs and landings into Metro Manila. But if you stretch the operating hours in the provinces, that you are effectively optimizing the, uh, the system. So there are a lot of you know, things going on with standardization. Uh, improve, even a simple thing like the collection of terminal fees and putting it into the ticket saves us passengers an extra you know, queue. Uh, so there are a lot of these little improvements that are happening. And some decisions have been made, but some are still uh, pending. Uh, me, we, me, need to, we need to move much faster on this. Let me interrupt you on that, on that note about pending. Um, many Filipinos, especially reporters like me, talk about how slow the government is in, uh, in making decisions. Um, is speed of government decisions rated in any of these surveys that, uh, that we track? Um, not directly, but I'll tell you why it has an impact. For us, when we uh, measure every year, there's a deadline for each and every one of these reports. So it's not like we can afford to take our time because you missed the cutoff. IFC, for instance, has a June 1st cutoff every year. If you make an improvement, your improvement must be in before June 1. It must be implemented. You have to start the implementation. You can't just write a law, okay? And you have to have measurement. If you don't have if you're missing one of those three, you're not yet done. So, Next year, never mind. Yeah, so what I, I always tell people, and, and this is a, a, a question that, you know, whenever you ask someone, how's this work coming along, they tell you, well, it's a work in progress. Uh, in the competitiveness ranking business, work in progress is equal to zero. Because you're only judged by your accomplishment. You're not judged by what's pending. One of the reasons we need to be competitive, as we said earlier, is ASEAN 2015, which is coming more or less at the end of 2015. I know there's a question in the audience from Randolph Ilawan about ASEAN. What are the plans or preparations of the manufacturing sector, the agricultural sector, and the service sector uh, for the next year, taking into consideration the ASEAN economic integration? And follow up to that question, uh, how this event impact or what are the pros and cons of this event to the said industries? First of all, uh, don't, don't expect a sudden impact. Uh, don't expect that your life will be turned upside down on January 1, 2016. Um, some of you are too young, but if you might remember Y2K, uh, but no, you were too young, right? Okay. In, in 99 to 2000, everyone's worried that all the computers would you know, stop running when the clock rolled over to year 2000. It is a very, it is a very it anxious New Year's Eve exactly, celebration. Exactly, but nothing happened, okay? So it's the same with, with ASEAN. Uh, the fact is, it's already been happening. If we take a look at the uh, tariff lines for most of the manufactured products, over 90%, they're already down to the, to the lowest levels possible within ASEAN. So where they aren't down are in agricultural products, uh, rice among them and others. So. Uh, that explains why our, our prices are, are high, as Ed was saying earlier. Uh, so what's going to happen is that uh, the effects are already being felt today. You can see a lot of products already in the market. Um, what could happen and, and where can we take advantage should be our posture. No? I think services, we might have the greatest advantage in services. One, because we have the second highest population in ASEAN after Indonesia. I think we have the highest English-speaking professional population in, you know, uh, in ASEAN. 
um, we have the ability, I think, to perform a service, whether the service is performed in the Philippines or we send people out. Either way, we have the ability to perform that service. We have the uh, lowest uh, median age, third lowest in ASEAN, uh, maybe just a little older than Cambodia and Laos, I think. We have the largest percentage of uh, working age population in ASEAN and growing. So uh, the, work, the worker base, so long as we keep, them, keep all our people very well educated and trained, gives us an advantage. And that advantage can be felt in many areas, but the immediate advantage, I believe, is, is in, in uh, services. The Philippine Development Plan talks a lot about uh, the need to be innovative. And uh, these, uh, these surveys that you track talk about things like uh, things that feed, feed uh, innovation, such as education, technology, production processes. You were talking about education, for example. Where do we stand on becoming, on being an innovative country? Uh, well, the good news is we've improved, okay? Uh, and there's such an index called the Global Innovation Index. And uh, it's run by the uh, World IPO Organization and uh, with a consulting firm, Deloitte, I think, does it. So uh, the good news is we've improved. Uh, the bad news is we're just in the middle of the pack in ASEAN, which is about number six out of, out of ten. And uh, we're a far six, meaning we're far from, you know, first, second, third, and fourth, maybe a bit close to the fifth. So uh, we've got to make a, a jump up. Now, if you take a look... Uh, at, at some surveys that, that track sort of innovation and what are the factors behind uh, innovation. There's some things worth remembering. One is innovation and inventiveness, creativity, are not acts of individuals. They are as much an act of a team. In fact, more people think it's teamwork rather than individual work. So I think that's something we're good at. Uh, also, it's something, uh, and take heart in this, it's not something you're born with. It's something you can learn. And, and it's a learned trait. Okay, so education, the, the biggest obstacle, you know, the biggest deterrent is if you have poor education and the biggest advantage is if you have great education. So that's something I think that we need to be thinking about. Uh, the world is also very po optimistic about innovation, thinking that we are at a, the best in history in innovation today, but the future looks even brighter. So it's not like we're going all downhill from here. So we have to make a decision. What do we want to do in terms of our education, our innovation? And we have that one asset. We have people to begin with. Okay? Especially young people. Young again, people, right? absolutely. I mean, uh, if you're, you know, our, our median age is what, 22? The, the large bulk of our population is, is uh, 35 and below. So uh, these are all assets. And, and the, fact that, the fact is many ASEAN countries uh, use Filipinos. To 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 uh, you know uh, for manpower purposes or service purposes uh, in uh, in their countries and the fact is the world uses 10 million Filipinos uh, uh, to to run their operations uh, the world's largest um, group of seafarers are Filipinos we're the, we have the largest market share of people at sea so. Obviously, there's a skill set that's there. We just have to jump the skill set from just being the skilled worker to being the manager. For instance, you don't want to be a seafarer. You just want to manage the ship. You want to run the ship. You want to run the ship company because that's where more of the money is. Uh, if you, I was in New Zealand early this year. Uh, the people who saved the New Zealand dairy industry, which is one of the largest dairy industries in the world, are Filipinos. Filipino farmers are running New Zealand dairy farms for the simple reason that New Zealand dairy farmers are getting older and their kids don't want to go to farming. So they're going to uh, places like UP Los Baños and others and getting them. And, and they're saving that industry. Before we go to a break, let's read some more comments we gathered from our friends on Facebook. Joseph says, aside from stopping corruption, government should invest more in rural areas of Visayas and Mindanao. Lito wants a stop to what he called unabashed skyrocketing taxes of local governments. He thinks that these make life harder for businesses and that eventually these are passed on to end users. And Edwin thinks that local governments are not empowered enough. He says funds should be reallocated to LGUs for projects in towns and provinces. He has with bottom-up budgeting, more of these projects can accommodate the needs of citizens. You can join our discussion online with the has hashtag PHDevelopment or leave a comment or reply on Twitter and Facebook. Watch our live streaming at www.abscbnnews.com live. Coming up, we'll talk about the way forward. 
how the government plans to turn the Philippine Development Plan into a reality. This is ANC Presents, Philippine Development in Focus. Welcome back. You're still watching ANC Presents Philippine Development in Focus with NEDA Chief Arsenio Balisakan about the way forward and Bill Luce of the National Competitiveness Council. Bill, before we went on the break, uh, we had a question from social media about local governments. How important are local governments to this whole effort to, uh, to make growth inclusive and to make the country more competitive? I, I think they're extremely important. Uh, they're one of the building blocks, obviously, of national competitiveness. Uh, you can't build a country the size of the Philippines, 100 million people on two or three cities. We need to build you know, 20, 25, 30 good, strong economic hubs. Uh, but we don't know where, you know, who's stronger, who's more competitive. Uh, so at NCC, we developed a city municipality competitiveness index. Uh, we took 30 broad indicators, and when you take a look at all the sub-indicators, you have about 130 sub-indicators that we collect. And uh, last year, we collected data on 285 LGUs. This year, uh, we're going to release uh, data on 530 LGUs. So now we will know, you know who's best in economic dynamism, who's best in governance, who's best in infrastructure, and then who's best overall. And they're ranked. And it's, this is not some survey. This is not some popularity contest. Uh, there are no board of judges. Uh, it's merely a statistical collection run through a mathematical or arithmetic formula and uh, uh, pretty well equally weighted. So there's no way to game it uh, by, by focusing on only one indicator. You have to you know, go across a broad front of indicators. And we'll find out uh, in a few weeks who's number one and who's number 530. Secretary Balisakan, before we go, um, where do we stand in terms of making growth more inclusive in this country and, and uh, and bringing down poverty and raising employment. And what does it look like going forward? Well, uh, the, uh, our plan is to raise that uh, level of growth uh, and to sustain it at a high level of 7 uh, uh, to 8 percent all the way to, to the medium term, uh, um, at least up to 2016. And together with the uh, uh, a more focused uh, sourcing of that growth in uh, areas and sectors of the economy where uh, uh, where employment is the, uh, or, or where uh, the unemployed is uh, is located, uh, uh, we expect to make a big dent on on uh, unemployment and on poverty. We also uh, with the fiscal space that uh, comes with uh, higher growth. Uh, and uh, improvement in the governance of our finances. We can afford to uh, invest more in uh, human capital, in social development, particularly in health and education. So if you combine rapid growth with uh, a more focused uh, uh, sourcing of that growth in sectors where you find the poor and investment in uh, in uh, health and education, uh, including the conditional cash transfers, you should be able to lick the poverty problem once and for all. Um, this is the, we're talking about the update to the Philippine Development Plan. It's a midterm update, which is actually middle of last year. Since then, several things have happened. We, of course, have what's happened to uh, the PDAF and the DAP. We, of course, have the slowdown in economic growth in the, in the first quarter. We now have problems with, with uh, rice and other food prices. How have all of these affected the way forward? 
We are monitoring these uh, 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 issues, these problems uh, closely, and uh, we don't think that uh, at this point we have any grounds for uh, 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 retreating from uh, the targets that we have uh, 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 designed for, for this year and for the next uh, two years. For example, we are keeping our growth rate at 65 to 7.5% this year, and uh, uh, our uh, investment in, uh, in infrastructure and social development, particularly in health and education, will continue. Uh, uh, the fiscal space is there. Uh, the, we, the, we think that the, the slowdown in the spending that we experienced uh, in, the, uh, in the last month is uh, very temporary. Uh, um, and I think we can move forward with, uh, uh, with normal course of things. Secretary Balisakan, thank you very much. Bill Luce, thank you very much. And also to our other panelists and guests in our studio, thank you very much. And thank you for watching. We hope you join us again for the next four episodes of this ANC presentation in cooperation with the National Economic Development Authority. Good night.